Okay, so every, uh, welcome everyone uh, again. Thank you for your patience, but it's nice to be just on time so everyone can uh, can see the, the, uh, the talk that they want to see. So we began with the, our first talk today. It's going to be by Dr. Jürgen Jungmans. He's a, an independent researcher. He studied at the University of Colm and Tübingen, and he's a specialist on experimental archaeology, and well, very well-known specialist on uh, te uh, prehistoric technology, and, uh, and especially in um, bows and, and arrows. He's author of the book uh, File und Bogen, uh, The Bow and the Arrow. And okay, he's going to talk about uh, exactly this today. So whenever you want, German, the, the floor is yours. I will activate your camera so everyone uh, can see you. And okay. uh, yeah, I just requested you to turn your camera so you can do it. And you can begin whenever you want. Thank you very much, Julian. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I hope you, you are all well. <clears throat> well, I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> the Stone Age archery technology in Europe. And I hope you will enjoy. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Uh, I begin with the with the first uh, evidence of bows and arrows uh, worldwide, which come from from northern Germany, and we have there uh, finds of uh, about hundred pine wood arrows, uh, which were used for reindeer hunting at about around, around ten thousand BC. Uh, they could be recovered during uh, World War II for, by a German archaeologist. And well, um, these are the uh, is the earliest proof of the use of bow and arrow worldwide. Still, uh, the arrows are made of pine wood, and they are made from two pieces. We have the main shaft, uh, which is about uh, seventy centimeters long and the foreshaft of about maybe 20 centimeters long and attached was a uh, arrowhead or flint uh, at the top and the, uh, the 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 main thing the main interesting thing is the knock the clearly identifiable notch at the at the butt end of the arrow the bottom end of the arrow which indicates that this arrow was uh, really shot from a bow and was put on a string with this notch here. Well, there's a problem that we have a lot of uh, projectile points that were found uh, in all places of the world. And many researchers believe that when you find um, uh, small uh, projectile points, that this is an indication of the use of bow and arrow. Well, it's not because you can use a small uh, arrowhead like projectile point on any projectile, uh, even on a spear, because we know that, uh, for example, in North America, the uh, small uh, arrowheads like projectile points were used on the atlatl darts with the foreshaft, because the foreshaft of the of the atlatl spear can be same diameter as an arrow, approximately one centimeter. And then we, you don't really need a big, uh, a big spearhead and you can use a smaller one. <clears throat> so, so far there's no evidence for the use of archery before 10,000 BC. It might be, have been used before, but uh, it's not possible to have a proof for it. So now I come to the Mesolithic archery finds. Uh, we have uh, around 40 bows that were found uh, in Northern Europe, mostly along the coast of, of Denmark and Sweden. They come from submerged uh, coast settlements and also from inland uh, bog sites sometimes. These bows were all made from elm wood, with I think one exception, 
and um, also we have uh, some arrows which were found around of 60 of them the early ones were all made of pine wood uh, uh, because that was the only wood that was available to the guys at that time and later on uh, we have additional <clears throat> woods which were used, for example, ha hazel <clears throat> and gelder rose or viburnum, uh, which uh, which entered the, the forest later, later times, and they were used as shoots, which had to be straightened by heat. Uh, an overview about the Mesolithic bow types on the left. Um, the older ones, we see that the, the bows uh, develop from uh, quite wide and flat bows uh, to a little um, more uh, narrow ones in during the time. And um, uh, we notice also that some of the bows have a dis uh, dedicated shoulder uh, uh, and a, a much more narrowed outer limb. And this uh, is uh, caused by, by the, the wish for, for more um, um, efficiency because the lighter limb of this uh, narrow limb can, uh, can uh, move faster and so I have a, a more uh, speedy arrow. <clears throat> More on this later. So we see some of the Mesolithic bows that were found. The oldest one uh, on top, the Holmegard, famous Holmegard bow from around 7,000 BC. We see it's quite a sturdy bow. It's, 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 uh, it's thick, it's wide and flat, and so it can store a lot of energy. And uh, also because it's so wide, it will not break easily. So this bow, Will uh, will accompany you on your hunting trip, and uh, it will it will not uh, break when you need it. The bow is only one meter and fifty long, which means that the that the archer was not uh, quite big because there is a, there is a, a, a thing that that the bow shouldn't be much bigger or much smaller than the um, than the archer himself. The best efficiency in, 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 in the bow will we uh, have when the bow is about the same size as the archer. Directly under the first bow, there's the bow from Link, Ring Kloster, which is, comes from about 5000 BC. And this bow is quite interesting because it's a long bow. It's uh, 174 centimeters long originally but it's it's quite it's quite uh, slender it's a thin bow so it cannot have been very strong i estimate this bow to to a strength of about 30 pounds only which could could uh, mean that this was either a woman's bow or maybe the bow of an old person which was not as strong uh, as the the younger or the stronger hunters uh, also interesting is that the cross section of this bow is quite oval and not so wide we will see some more of this kind of cross sections later on so please keep that in mind directly underneath is the magnum Mosogard bow it's a bow with a very defined uh, uh, shape and very nice cross sections, which is uh, elliptic in the in the main part of the of the bow limb, and the um, the tip of the bow is very very narrow and rounded, totally rounded, which means it has a very very uh, light mass only, and it will shoot an arrow very fast. This is a kind of, uh, of a, a high energy bow. It will, it will, it will have a great, great arrow flight. Later on, we see bows that are narrower than the, 
than the uh, the wide limbed uh, versions uh, of the older bows, and with a D shaped cross section, not very elaborated, but uh, uh, well good bows uh, um, used for hunting and um, well made from elm at this time because there was no other bow wood available. The last bow I would like to mention is the, the kids bow or youth bow from Hüde in Germany. And this bow is one of the very rare uh, Mesolithic bows made from yew wood. Yew or taxus or techo is clearly the best bow wood that we uh, have in Europe. And this bow is uh, made from you. It's a very tiny bow. It's used for it's used by 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 a youth, by by a teenager maybe. And it's very narrow. It's not very strong. And um, well, I go on with an extreme example of a performance bow. The Möller Gabbard bow from from Denmark is is made in a very special way on this so far it's a unique bow we don't have other examples of this extremely uh, shaped bows uh, in the main bending part the bow is narrow and wide with elliptic uh, cross section but in the tip in the in the tip the the, the cross section is super narrow and very thick so that means it's it's very light in comparison to to a, to a wider bow limb, and it will can it can travel at a very very high velocity. So this will be the fastest bow uh, possible um, when we use a wooden material for making making a bow. Uh, today. We use this design for making bows for shooting big distance. It's a kind of uh, special sport, flight archery, and, and um, this design will shoot an arrow furthest. So this will give you a world record, maybe, if you use it at a tournament. Um, the interesting thing is that the, the outer limb, because it's so high and so narrow, it is, uh, it's a little bit um, instable. So it can happen that this moves sideways and you have a crooked bow. So it needs a little bit of uh, maintaining and always looking if the bow is still okay or bending sideways. Um, so um, it's a very special bow. Um, by the way, it's the only it's a bow of the youth. It's not very long. It's, I think it's about one meter thirty or so. But still, it's uh, it's it's the only example of a bow type that otherwise we wouldn't know of. I, I think we have only we don't have only uh, kids bows of this design because it's so elaborated and so genial. We will also have had adult bows of the same design, but they were not found yet. So now we come to the Neolithic period. The Neolithic archery finds are uh, mainly concentrated uh, around the Alps. We have uh, lots of finds in the Swiss and Southern German and North Italian uh, uh, seashore uh, settlements um, where we found many, many bows. There's also some bows from northern Germany, from box sites, or from, from England even. Uh, so far we count about 150 bow finds and about 140 finds of arrows or fragments. Well, the Neolithic bow was only made from one wood type, and this is the best wood they could find. It's it's, uh, it's yew wood, Taxus baccata, and so far there's no exception from this rule. All bows were made from this wood, even the smallest kids' bows 
uh, for 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 maybe for a very small child was made from this wood. So for these people, the yew tree was the only suitable uh, wood for bows. It's very important to note that we have on the back of the bow the sap wood, which means the outer layer of wood, which was grown latest. And this is the the sap wood is um, is much more flexible flexible than the hardwood, and uh, this is the reason why people leave it on the back of the bow to protect it from breaking. I investigated the sapwood presence on 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 prehistoric bows, and um, I could find that on two thirds of the bows, I see indication of the sapwood. On eighteen percent of the bows, I could not find any indication, but this doesn't mean that it wasn't there, because sometimes it's just not observable. 19% of the bows, I could not uh, have any data, uh, sufficient data to uh, to make investigation. So, um, ah, well, we have, we have uh, one exception uh, from the rule of the U-bow, and this is one bow found in, uh, in a well for water in, uh, in the uh, Linua pottery culture well in Western Germany. It's a very exceptional find. This is Kukhoven and it's dated to, to around 5100 BC. And in this, in this well, in the sediments of this well, we found a lot of organic uh, artifacts, including a bow or, or, or fragments of a bow and also fragments of arrows. This bow is made from elm wood. And if we look at the shape of this bow, it's very similar to the Magna Mosegard bow from, from Denmark. So I think this is a Mesolithic style bow. I'm not sure if it's made, really made by the linear pottery culture people. Uh, because, as we all know, they uh, were not uh, um, they were not they were coming from southern Europe, so I think they have made other bows than this, and this is probably a trade in from Mesolithic people living in the north of that. In Neolithic bow technology, we have a lot of variations. We have, um, I would say experiments in cross-section designs. We have the normal D cross-section with rounded back and flat belly. We have the same with the concave belly. We have a kind of uh, rectangular um, uh, trapezoidal uh, cross-section with uh, more or less flat back. And we have also uh, um, trapezoidal uh, forms with concave back, uh, uh, belly, sorry. So far, I don't really know what the people wanted to intend with these, uh, with these experiments. I'm not, I'm sure they did not make the bow better, but maybe they thought that the bow was better. So they decided we do it like this in a certain time at a certain place, um, but, but then all of a sudden they they use other cross sections and in the end they return to the normal flat bellied D cross section. To illustrate the thing with the hardwood and sapwood, I have here a slide with uh, the yew tree and this is the uh, Cross D-shaped cross section, and you see that in, in the back there is a portion of the sap wood to protect the bow. This is the cross section of the bows from La Draga, which are a little different, and we will come to that later. But also here we have indication that the sap wood uh, was indeed used for these bows. 
uh, overview about the Neolithic bow types. You see there's a lot of them and um, we have uh, lots of gaps in the chronology and we don't have really a good understanding of the development of the bow because we have only finds of some certain regions and certain periods and in between we don't know what they did so uh, but what's really interesting that's is that we have two different traditions which occur at the same time in but in several in different places uh, uh, this is the so-called propeller bow tradition which uh, well because the front wheel looks like a propeller with a um, uh, narrow grip and and um, narrow ends. And we have the second tradition, which is the, the straight limb bow. We, are, we have no uh, narrowing in the handle and the tips are still a bit uh, wide. Uh, we have, um, well, the oldest bow we so far have are from La Draga. These are the oldest ones and they have the, the elliptical uh, cross section, which we already saw on this ring called Loster bow from Denmark, which probably belongs to the same time. So probably, probably this was a thing of around 5000 BC, Neolithic bows, uh, Mesolithic bows too. Uh, that they use this kind of cross section. Later on, we see the occurrence of the D-shaped cross section with flat back, which is here. Uh, the the experimental phase begins in the middle or well, late ne Neolithic with these concave uh, cross sections, which we have here, and uh, also in the other tradition we have the same the same kind of uh, concave cross section but a little bit before or older in time uh, in the late or end neolithic we have a lot of variation we have uh, this strange elliptical uh, cross section with flat belly and uh, concave back at the same time like trapezoidal cross sections and super narrow um, D-shaped cross section. So far, it doesn't give a clear view of the development and it's a puzzle. We have only a few uh, mosaic stones which really don't tell the whole story. It's very confusing, I must admit this, but that's all uh, we have now. So we keep in mind that Neolithic bow makers were quite uh, expensive experimental. They wanted to to improve the bow, but maybe maybe they only thought that they improved it with this kind of strange cross section and later on they found out, well, we can return to our conservative uh, D-shaped cross section now because uh, it doesn't shoot better or, or worse than all the other cross sections. Now we see some actual Neolithic bows and on top, uh, again, a strange or interesting bow, a very narrow bow of a length that indicates uh, it's, it was shot by adult people. It's nearly one meter 80 long, so quite long bow for prehistoric times and um, very narrow cross section. And um, this bow, is also very slim and slender and I I think this bow was not stronger than again that than 30 pounds of draw weight. This could mean that it was used by a woman or maybe by an older person which not longer had the strength uh, to uh, to to shoot a strong hunting bow. Uh, this is a perfect example of a straight limb bow, um, the bow from, from Tyngen in Switzerland. This bow has a very narrow cross section, D-shaped cross section with a slightly concave 
belly and clearly indication of sap wood on the belly. This was a very good bow, uh, one meter 70 long. And the next bow is the bow from Bootman, which is a perfect example of the propeller shaped bow uh, with a very narrow handle and, and very narrow tips and uh, quite wide cross section, uh, D-shaped with flat belly. This bow is only one meter 50 long, but uh, it's so strong it's uh, it's about 60 pounds i uh, i think that it was could only be used by uh, by a strong uh, hunter we have more bows from from later neolithic this is a fragment of a bow from horgan Scheller with a very pronounced concave belly and propeller shape and uh, another late Neolithic bow. This is the bow from from Nanovville, which has the strange cross section with it, which, which is ellipsoidal, with uh, a with a concave uh, belly. From uh, two thousand eight hundred BC. Uh, from the same time, but uh, from a different place, um, from the Bernese Alps, we have this magnificent bow find from the Schniederjoch. We will talk later about this, uh, this, this, this wonderful find place. And this is a perfect example of a straight limb bow uh, with a very narrow uh, D-shaped cross section. And this bow was one meter 60 long. And it's, uh, it's a hunting bow for an adult hunter. And it perfectly, um, preservation state is uh, it's completely preserved and um, uh, even the wood is so so good that that when I first saw this bow I had it in my hands I thought wow this bow even has the weight of uh, of a, a newly made bow so probably we could even brace it and shoot it but of course this uh, will not happen and it's a joke. So I was computing the distribution of the length of all the Neolithic bows that we have. And it shows that the most of the Neolithic bows that we know and where the original length is possible to determine are around one meter 50 and one meter 80. There are some, some specimens which are extremely long but there are not many. There's one in this category and one in this category. And also we have several bows in the one meter 40 to one meter 45 category. Uh, and I think now that these bows are probably uh, bows for teenagers. Uh, when we compare this with the statistical body size of prehistoric, uh, of Neolithic, men in, in, in Middle Europe, which we can see here in the red uh, <coughs> um, uh, column. Then we see it's around 1 meter 60 and 1 meter 70. We have the distribution of body length. And this uh, would, would quite nicely fit into the length uh, of, the, of the bows so that the Neolithic people <clears throat> probably did the same as we do today. So they made the bow uh, length according to the body length. When we look at the <clears throat> approximate strength of the Neolithic bows, we see that they are quite strong and they are mostly between 30 and, and 80 pounds of draw weight. Uh, these are uh, the, the 50 to 80 pounds are clearly uh, adults hunting, hunters bows and um, below, below 40 pounds, I would guess that they were probably used by teenagers and probably these are the uh, uh, small bows. Um, 
it's it's very nice that we have also a lot of kids and and youth bows from excavations uh, in may, well mainly in Switzerland. Um, we can can see that the people were used to <clears throat> to give uh, very very small bows to small children already uh, to make them practice uh, archery at a very young age to become uh, a good archer when they were grown up and um, this is a habit that we can observe also uh, in ethnographical uh, data for example uh, uh, in this documentary movie from from uh, from uh, Eskimo people uh, Inuit people which also try to give uh, at a very young age, when when a kid can can barely walk, uh, it uh, they give it a bow as a gift and arrows, and uh, it can begin to practice the important uh, practice of archery. Well, uh, the smallest Neolithic uh, kids' bows are only for around forty centimeters long, and they're barely more than a and a piece of, of a shoot, uh, a small branch of, of, of you, which is not very uh, elaborately worked on, but we can see it's a bow because it's thicker in the center and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's thinner in the end. So it means it bend evenly. And uh, this is not a bow for making fire, but for shooting. <clears throat> so this indicates that they already uh, began archery training in, at an age about maybe like two or three years, I would guess. Uh, other bows with, of different uh, size show that they, at each age, the, the kids or the teenagers, they got um, bows of their body size. So they could all the time practice archery and um, become better and better with it. Um, well, uh, to look at the uh, technology of Neolithic bow making, we luckily have uh, some happy finds of not finished bows. This is, a, is an example from uh, Feldmeilen in Switzerland. It's dated to 3800 BC. And this bow was shaped in, in, a, in, a, in a quite crude way. It's not very elaborately finished. So it's only the first stage of uh, bow making that we can here have a look at. Uh, well, we see traces of splitting the, the tree. This is a split. Um, inside of the tree. So they split it first to get rid of the other half of the tree. And then I think the next step was debarking the, the, the tree, which was chosen for making the bow. And they, as long as the wood is fresh, you can take off the whole bark in one, in one, in one step. You only rip it off and you have a uh, the surface of the of the sapwood. Uh, another step was uh, shaping the the bow uh, in a in a quite crude way. But we can see that the intention was to make a bow. It's already it's already slender at the ends, and we see the cross section already begins to to resemble a bow. But it's not really worked. Uh, uh, worked well already. So this bow blank was discarded, we don't know why, before it could be further worked. We have also other uh, bow making uh, proof in unfinished bow fragments from other places. This here on the left side, this is a, uh, a bow blank or fragment from Twan. Uh, this is about the same stage like the Feldmarlen bow blank. It's not very finished, not very finely prepared, 
it's, 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 I think it's in the same stage. But after preparing the, the rough shape, the bow needed to be further refined. And this we can quite nicely observe in the unfinished bow fragment from Zürich Mozartstraße. Here in the top part, we see the, the not very finished uh, former stage of the bow making. And uh, from in, in, in this part, is already very finely rounded and the cross section is very good worked uh, and I think they people used also uh, hatchets or adzes for this task but also maybe another type of tool uh, we say marks of the scraping instrument which would be a scraper or a blade of flint to refine the the cross section now we come to the important finds of la draga in catalonia these are the oldest neolithic bows so far found in europe they date from one for 5200 bc and they are also the first bows or the oldest bows made from yew trees Taxus Bacata. Yew tree was uh, at that time uh, first appearing uh, in, in, in Northern Europe uh, about this time um, before, um, before we don't, don't have evidence of yew trees growing. Uh, they were not yet uh, there because all the bows they had to, to, uh, to come back after the, after the ice age. And around 5000 BC, we see the first evidence of bow in Northern Europe. In Spain, probably it's a little bit before. Uh, now we see again the oval cross section of, uh, of the ring cluster bow, uh, of this, which is probably about the same time. So um, I think this is, uh, this is a habit of, uh, the time, the period around 5000 BC. Uh, we have three bows from, from La Draga. There's a Daltz bow. Here's only a fragment. It's a very thick bow, which originally was one meter 60 long. And we have the fragment of a youth bow, which was about one meter and 40. And we have the whole complete uh, kids bow of one meter and 80 long or from this fine uh, settlement. Uh, we did quite a lot of experimenting with the La Draga bows. And the first experimental bow that I made was the reconstruction of the adults bow. And this bow was quite strong. When I finished it, it was about 70 pounds, at 28 inches, which is, for today's standards, a very strong bow. And um, it's, well, it's a very strong hunting bow. And we did not test this bow for distance, but I'm sure from, from comparison with other bows that I made, that this bow is capable of shooting more than 200s of maximal distance. The team of La Draga uh, excavations came to our home to make further uh, experiments in bow mating, bow making, and we tried to replicate uh, the smaller bows. And we were beginning with the with the youth bow, and we were felling a little yew tree in the garden and began working on it. And the first step after felling it was the splitting with. Uh, with the help of antler and wooden um, um, wedges. And this took about eight minutes. The further working of the shape was, was made with, uh, with hatchets or uh, edges. And this was made directly after, after felling. So the wood was still, still green and soft and very good to work with stone tools. Uh, the roughing out of the shape of this boat 
took about 70 minutes. Before refining the bow, it was necessary to dry the wood first because the next steps are not possible with with the with the wet wood because it's too soft and it can it cannot be worked uh, with scrapers and it also it cannot be bent it should not be uh, bent before it's dry because then it will take a, a very strong uh, bend and which will not recover so we let it dry for about two weeks and the weight was of this bow uh, blank was reduced from around 500 to around 300 grams in this period. And you can see that it's dry when it doesn't lose any more weight. The next steps were scraping with flint blades and uh, which was very easy uh, for uh, refining the, the shape of the bow. And I found out that at some places where uh, where the um, the bow has uh, imperfections like small um, um, uh, nodes or uh, uh, I don't know how to, to say this now in English, uh, there it's, it's very, very difficult to scrape it because it will not be uh, it will not be uh, um, uh, really really nice and flat after scraping. I discovered that I could use um, a coarse uh, piece of sandstone like a rasp or of lime, and this works very well uh, uh, in these imperfections. And the whole work of refining the bow shape took about one hundred five minutes. Next step was to shape the knocks or the, the, the tips were with the, um, with the notches for, for the bowstring. And this could easily be made with a sharp uh, flint knife. And uh, also we made the, the string, or I made the string from, from flex, from which was modern fabricated uh, flex uh, yarn that I used, that I always use for my bow strings, which was of very good quality. And all this took about 25 minutes only. Then the fir first stringing of the bow uh, happened and I saw that the bow is, was not really uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in an even shape. And the uh, one limb was bending more than the other one. So uh, another important step had to be done. That's the, uh, the so-called tillering. In tillering, we reduce wood from stiff spots of the bow to make it bend more evenly. And this continues until uh, the bow bends in, in a perfect uh, semi-arc. It can take a lot of time sometimes and it's it's not very easy for a beginner of bow making but in this case the bow was already in a quite good shape before and it took only 10 minutes to scrape it at certain places to achieve a certain uh, uh, even bending of the limbs the bow was furthermore polished by by using the sandstone again and then by using um, the horsetail plant uh, stems, um, which can be used like a, like a modern uh, sandpaper. And uh, this was used to, to, to have a nice and perfect uh, surface of the bow. And all in all, this took about 75 minutes. So uh, now we see uh, an overview of all the material that we had to take off and all time spent for making the bows. Uh, well, for the, the youth bow, all the 
the uh, total working time was about six hours. For the kids, though, it was about four hours only. I estimate the time needed for making a, a bigger hunting bow and for an adult hunter for about eight hours. After the bows were finished, we had to test them uh, for maximum distance. And here you see the, the, the youth bow, the 145 centimeter long bow. And this had a strength of 32 pounds at 28 inches, and it could shoot uh, arrows to distance, distances between 110 and 120 meters, which is very good. The smaller the kid's bow was uh, uh, softer, and it draw about 24 uh, pounds at 20 inches, and it could shoot arrows to around 80 to 90 meters, surprisingly well. Now we come to the, to the famous uh, site of Schneidejoch from 2800 BC. It's uh, situated in the, in the Swiss Alps. And this is like the, like the Ötzi find. It's, it's a place which was covered by ice. So we have extremely good preservation of all, all organic materials. And in this place, a lot of, a lot of uh, artifacts were found. We found a bow, we found a bowstring, uh, uh, we found also a container or bow case made of birch bark and eight contemporary arrows to this bow. This is the bow. It's uh, perfectly preserved due to the ice. And it's one meter 60 long and um, really in a perfect state of preservation. I made four replicas of this bow, two successful ones and two broken ones. The first one is uh, turned out to 52 pounds and the second one, the nicest one to about 55 pounds. And the other ones were extremely strong, maybe because the wood was too dry and they were, these were, were breaking later on. Did a few tests of arrow speed with the nicest, the 55 pound bow. And this bow showed the uh, arrow speeds between 150 and 190 kilometers per hour, which is quite, quite good. Uh, we have to keep in mind that the Neolithic arrows were quite heavy. So they would be about uh, in the 150 kilometers per hour compartment and um, not in this, which is more a uh, 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 modern arrow weight, which is what was not used for hunting in the prehistoric times. The Schneiderjoch bowstring is a very interesting find because it's one of only two bowstrings that we have from the Neolithic. It's made from animal tendon and it's, uh, it's about 3.6 millimeters thick and the three uh, ply uh, twist. And it was found just beneath the bow case. So it, it shows that this was really a bowstring. Additionally, we can find uh, the, arrowhead, the arrows made from Bibonum and Lonikera, and they were 80 to 90 centimeters long, and also some silex arrowheads, which were found in the bow case. The bow case is made from birch bark, and it's one meter 70 meters long. Uh, it perfectly fits the bow. Um, it has a removable cap, so the bow can be put inside. Uh, it's made in a way that it's rainproof and it can be worn over the shoulder to keep the hands free when you are walking in the mountains. It's a very interesting find. Here are some more details. 
uh, of the bulkcase. It's very, it's a very interesting construction. Jürgen, uh, sorry, you have yes. Jürgen, you have five minutes left. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's not very heavy, so it's very convenient to to uh, to wear it. Well, the bowstrings, we only have two specimens of bowstrings. The one from Schniedejoch, I already mentioned, there's a similar one from, 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 Ötz, from the Ötzi find, which is more long and also made from animal sinew. <clears throat> there was also some uh, conspicuous finds from other places, from, uh, from plant fibers, for example, this, uh, cord from nettle fiber from La Draga, which we supposed to have been used uh, as a bowstring maybe, but uh, tests did show that the material of nettle fiber is not strong enough for making bowstrings. Another possibility is flex fiber. Flex fiber is very suitable for bowstrings and could have been used, but the, unfortunately there is no find from the Neolithic so far. This is the test, one of the tests done with uh, a nettle fiber string, and even with a low poundage bow, a very weak bow, it broke at the very first shot, so it's not usable. Uh, Neolithic arrow technology, well, the arrows were quite long and made from shoots of bibonum mostly, and they have fletching uh, of three, uh, half of feathers and glued with birch bark tar and also the triangular uh, silex arrowhead fixed with birch bark tar. The arrows are quite thick, around one centimeter or more at the tip and a little smaller diameter at the other end. Here we see the making of arrows, straightening of the vibonum shot, scraping, debarking, splitting the notches and uh, spreading of the birch bark tar for the um, fetching, which takes about 10 minutes. And only one gram of birch bark tar is, new, is used in this part of the arrow. Gluing and binding of the fletching, hafting of the arrowhead with uh, birch bark tar finished arrow, uh, a little bit of penetration test. We were able to shoot uh, at this torso of uh, ballistic gelatine with a very lightweight bow and the arrows penetrated quite nicely into the, into the torso, which would have been a deadly shot. Well, I thank you very much for your listening and I hope you enjoyed the, the speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Jürgen. It has been a very nice, complete and thorough explanation of uh, prehistoric uh, bows in general. So I've just sent to the all the chat. If we if you want, we have a, a few minutes for, for questions. So please write them down and I will uh, explain, uh, translate it to, to Jürgen. So um, just to begin, um, I have one uh, question that I, I'm not really familiar with uh, technology of bows, but I've seen that it's very, uh, you state many times la, uh, about the size. Uh, the size is equal to the height of the, uh, of the shooter, let's say. Uh, I wanted to ask you if it's always like that with every kind of bow, with every one, uh, kind of raw material taxa, you have the same person, uh, it's uh, the formula, it's the same size, is the same as height, or it's not always like that? Well, well, it's a little bit more difficult, of course, it's not always like that. But mm -hmm. if if you're using a, a simple bow made of made of made of wood, it's the best you can do. If the bow is too short, it can break because you draw it too, too far. If the bow is too long, it's too, uh, the limbs are too heavy, so the arrow will not be very, very fast. So it's the best mm -hmm. you can do, but you are not obliged to do it. And well, I think the evidence we have from the from the body size of the of the of the Neolithic people that this was more or less the case in the Neolithic. 
but probably not always. But we see that there are very long bows too. Um, probably some are some are made to impress other people or maybe for other uh, things like uh, de depositing in a sacred place or other things. So it was mainly the case, but it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I I realized that I had the the chat <laughs> uh, closed, but now now it's open. Um, okay, so there we have a question here. Que porta la, exper la teva experiència com a constructor d'arcs a l'estudi dels arcs? So the question is more or less uh, what is your expertise uh, in bow constructing, uh, adding into the study, the research on on uh, prehistoric bows, let's say. So, which uh, um, from the, your perspective, as uh, as uh, I end, uh, if I understand the question correctly, yeah? uh, from your perspective as a constructor, as a technician of, on on uh, bow making, what what's your uh, what is what you add to the study of the research of the uh, of the bows? Well, I began bow making maybe thirty years ago, and because I was interested in experimental archaeology. And the first ones, of course, were not very good. They were breaking because I did not know how to make it. And then slowly, step after step, I improved my bow making skill. So mm -hmm. I know I, I, that I made maybe several hundred bows and uh, of all kinds. And I think I, I, can, I can call myself a very experienced bow maker. Mm -hmm. And well, um, so I can well, <laughs> just state it like that. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I understand. So uh, I had also another question from the a technological point of view, um, because I, I was lucky enough to be one of the the team that we excavated the the bow in La in La Draga that we found that it was um, I, well, it, it was like one of the best experiences in archaeology is when you find these this kind of finds and all of a sudden in, in the mud you find all this uh this uh, beautiful bow it was well something really special but i realized and i've seen on on all your images that bows of course they are uh, the tails are uh, uh blended let's say uh, my question was if they are blended because the, the the wood has been blended or they have been worked to be like more curved let's say instead of uh, blended you understand what i'm why i'm asking if it's this shape of the bows that we uh, see today it's because this wood has been blended to be like that or it has been directly worked to be uh, uh curved let's say yeah okay if i understand it right uh, you mean why the bow is curved um yeah Mm -hmm. After unstringing, yeah. well, that's why the that's because the the wood is compressed. It, it it's uh, it's uh, when you shoot the bow, when you draw it, it's bent uh, very strongly, and a little bit of this bend stays permanently after after you unstring it because the 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 wood is compressed on the on the inside of the bow. Mm -hmm. The, but the wood it's not collapse it, a little bit. It's not because it has been worked to be no, like no. that. No, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. No, in contrary, we we'll, we we'll like it if the bow stays straight, because uh -huh. then it has more power in shooting. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. So yeah, if you have more questions, chat. Yeah, I see another one here. Yeah. So I will read directly. Uh, bow making basics for beginners that uh, teach you to create the bow with a single growth uh, grow ring for for the back of the bow. Is it like that in prehistoric bows? Since the drawing uh, you showed, it doesn't look like that. Thank you very much. I uh, I can read it again. Maybe. Bow making basics for beginners teach you to create. Uh, to create the bow with a single grow ring for the for the back of the bow okay that's what uh, santi says yes. is it like that in prehistoric bows because he says that uh, the drawings that you show it doesn't look like that well uh 
well, it's in, in the books, you read it like that. But uh, there are some problems in executing this. The first problem is the U wood is sometimes is so finely grained. The, uh, the view rings are so narrow that they are less less than maybe half a millimeter. It's only, it's thin like a sheet of paper. So mm -hmm. when you scrape the bow, you you will scrape through a U-ring uh, very easily. So that's why the people uh, sometimes uh, scrape through a U-ring on, on the back of the bow. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, uh, that when you are more experienced as a bow maker, you find out that you don't have to follow precisely one ring. Mm -hmm. If if it's very narrow, for example, you can violate the rings, but um, you should follow the the shape of of the surface of the tree. It's it's not it's not necessary to follow follow one ring, but follow more or less the the waves and the uh, imperfections on on the tree more Adapt or less to the, adapting uh, to the wood yeah and the more experienced you become as a bow maker the more you will find that you will violate the rings mm -hmm. um uh, asks uh, thank you for interesting presentation could i ask some more information about the neolithic bow technology you showed the different cross sections you mentioned the different experiments but you said the, they didn't cause any difference related to function. That didn't Im, uh, impose function. So, what is uh, the so what is the deliberate effort? Could you give some more details, please? So I understand that if in the, she asks if the um, if the shape it equals to some kind of function. Some uh, if I understand that right. Yeah. Well. Okay, uh, the different cross sections. Yes. Um, I think that some of the cross sections, for example, the extremely concave cross section is not very good. It's, it's, it's probably worse than the D-shaped cross section. Uh, generally, uh, all these cross sections, when I tried to, to make different bowls, they didn't change the way the bow shoots. The, they didn't shoot better or mm -hmm. worse than any other bows. What I found out during my long experience of making bows um, is that the main factor of the quality of the bow is the quality of the wood, mm -hmm. because the, the wood can be of different quality, even if it's the same species, it can be average quality, it can be very bad quality, and it can be excellent quality. And this makes a very big difference in the finished bow. Of course, we don't know how the quality of the bows at that time was. It maybe was uh, varied. The other, the other main influence on the quality of the bow is the way it is made. Uh, most importantly, the shape of the band bow, the tiller ring. If you do that in, in a very good way, in a correct way, the bow will shoot much better than a, a badly mm -hmm. tillered bow. So these okay. two factors are the most important. And the okay. shape of the cross section is, in my view, not very important at all if you choose a cross section that is uh, usable, of course. The, if you if you do it completely yeah. wrong, it, it will not work at all. But all these cross sections that we saw here, they do their job. But okay. none of them is better or worse than than the others. Okay, thank you very much, Jurgen. And of course, if uh, someone else from the chat have any questions, you can grant it down, and we can send it to Jurgen later on. But now we reach to our pose of po coffee pose. So I'm sorry, we don't have coffee here. So everyone at their home, you should go for a, for a coffee. And we meet in half an hour at 12 o'clock. And we continue with our next talk by uh, Dr. Esther Lopez Montalvo. OK, so thank you very much for being here. And we see you in, in a few minutes. Bye.
Okay. 